Thank you very much for, uh, for being here. It's a real uh, pleasure for me uh, uh, to have been asked to uh, chair this session and, and uh, generally to be uh, present, not the least uh, because it's uh, such a wonderful opportunity to, to see so many uh, friends and, 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 uh, uh, and, and former um, uh, colleagues. I see uh, also in, in, in the crowd uh, uh, Nicholas Morris. Nicholas Morris was responsible for recruiting me uh, to, to uh, UNHCR in uh, 1994. I'm not sure if that was a good thing for UNHCR, but it was certainly a good thing uh, uh, for me. So it's so nice to, to see uh, so many uh, um, friends. But of course, um, uh, just as, as, as importantly, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased because of the criticality and the, the, the relevance and the importance of the issue that we're here to discuss during this session, that of, of refugees and, and um, displacement. Uh, when I was um, re-reading the uh, voluminous uh, report on, on, on refugees by the uh, Commission, um, uh, a few uh, days ago, I noted that um, uh, at the time, and uh, at that time I was, actually, I was actually very young and still at university, um, and, and unaware of, of refugee issues, I noted that at the time there were 13 million uh, uh, refugees, at least that's what the report says. And uh, of course today there are about 23 uh, million uh, refugees. Um, if we also uh, take into account the fact that just in the past few weeks, uh, as you know, more than half a million Rohingyas have been forced into exile into uh, uh, Bangladesh. And I think that uh, the, 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 that figure of 23 million, but also that horrendous figure of half a million people or more being, being, being forced to move in a, literally in a matter of, of, of uh, weeks uh, uh, brings uh, home the, the point in a very dramatic manner of just, just you know, how critical this issue um, um, remains. Um, we will, what we will try to do in this, uh, I think now we may have a little bit less than, a, than, than an hour, maybe 50, uh, minutes. What we'll try to do is um, to look back, uh, of course, uh, uh, using the, the, the report of the Commission as a, as a starting base, but also very much to uh, use that uh, to look forward uh, to what lies ahead, what are the challenges, but most importantly uh, of all, as, as I think uh, um, Sarah tried to do or did, uh, very successfully in, in the initial session uh, to maybe come up with some uh, practical I, I, uh, ideas and, and, and um, uh, uh, solutions. So to help us do this uh, this afternoon, we have a um, very important set of, of, of <coughs> panelists. I will not go into the uh, details of their uh, background and, and experience because although they are um, still young, their careers are, are long and uh, distinguished. So they, the, the details, of course, are in the program. Um, so I would just mention uh, very, very uh, 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 quickly um, uh, who they are. They're, I'm very happy to be here with uh, Pia uh, Oberoi from the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and who I understand specializes or focuses on the migration and human rights side of, of migrants within um, um, OHEHR. We have, of course, Martin. Martin really doesn't need uh, an introduction apart from his long career in the uh, U UN, an architect, uh, as Lord Mark Mander Brown uh, acknowledged, <coughs> of this um, um, uh, conference, is also now an independent analyst. He was uh, also the person who recruited me into the UN into Yunocha in Islamabad in 1991. So it's also an enormous uh, uh, pleasure uh, to, to, to be here with you. 
Martin. And then, of course, we have Jeff Grace, who really also doesn't need uh, an, uh, an introduction. He's been working on refugee affairs inside the UN and outside uh, the UN for, for many, many years. And uh, I should add, you probably already know this, but uh, of course, these two um, uh, gentlemen were actually involved in the drafting of the, um, uh, of the Commission's uh, uh, report um, on, um, uh, on refugees. So we, we, uh, I think we will also benefit very much from their um, inside uh, knowledge. Um, uh, I think the, the first question that, uh, with which I would like to open the um, uh, discussion is that of, of look, uh, uh, a, bit look, a mixture of looking back and, and also um, uh, looking uh, uh, ahead, which is whether um, um, you think that the, the analysis, the observations, and the recommendations of the Commission's report on, on <coughs> refugees uh, remain uh, 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 relevant uh, 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 today, and but perhaps just um, to um, start that discussion, uh, I wanted to to just very very quickly read out two or three. Of course, it, this is, report is a uh, hundred and I think twenty pages, so it was not easy to pick two or three uh, sentences. Uh, uh, from it, uh, with, with which I wanted to start this discussion on, on whether the Commission's um, report uh, is, 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 is um, r relevant. Um, there was the first one that caught my um, attention is the one that says, the experience of recent years does not leave room for optimism regarding the future. Just as one refugee situation diminishes or stabilizes, new mass exodus occur elsewhere. The second one is about the behavior of, or approach of industrialized states. And I quote, the industrialized states are adopting what appear to be contradictory standards. They expect and assume that some of the world's poorest countries will maintain an open door policy towards millions from neighboring states. But they are increasingly reluctant to grant asylum to the thousands who arrive on their own territory. At the same time, the role of the world's more influential states is negligible in helping to eliminate the root causes and to resolve the situations which have created these refugees. And finally, uh, a mention uh, that also caught uh, uh, my, my uh, attention, which is on a, on a uh, group um, uh, uh, of displaced persons uh, who are not uh, uh, refugees, but who are also in a very vulnerable situation, and I quote again, on the other side of the spectrum are millions of uprooted people who are unable or unwilling to leave their own country. They are, in the jargon of the refugee specialists, internally displaced and do not qualify for the kind of protection and assistance offered to refugees. So with that, uh, maybe I will ask uh, uh, Jeff uh, first to, to <coughs> share uh, his thoughts with us. Yeah, thanks very Please, much, Gonzalo. Um, maybe I'll just quickly begin with some acknowledgements. Firstly, to Zia himself. Zia was certainly one of the most important people in my personal and professional life. Professionally, he helped me to get my first job in UNHCR, <laughs> uh, where I stayed for the next 26 years. Uh, but more importantly than that, he actually persuaded me to get married. Uh, <laughs> and my, my wife and younger son are here today, so I think that goes down a sustained impact. Uh, <laughs> secondly, to Martin Barber, who actually gave me my first breakthrough into the refugee world and recruited me to the British Refugee Council back in about 1983, I think it was who made a very important role in the drafting of the report. And then finally, my very good friend Nick Van Heer is sitting towards the back. Nick's uh, my oldest friend. I think we did our PhDs together. We worked on the ICHI report on refugees together. We both ended up doing refugee-related stuff in Oxford. So Nick's good to have you here. So what about the report then? Well, 
I go to a lot of presentations on the global refugee situation, and I guess this is a kind of a standard presentation which many people give today, and it goes something like this. You know, the refugee issue, the refugee problem is, is much bigger now than it used to be. It's become far, far more complex than it used to be. It has a lot of features which are new and very different from how it was in the past, and the protection standards are gradually diminishing. And rereading the ICHI report uh, a few weeks ago in preparation for this conference, I kind of came to the conclusion that this is essentially a false narrative. And while I would agree that protection standards are in decline, I think it has to be said, as we said in terms of the armed conflict in IHL, that there was never a golden age of refugee protection. But also in, in many other respects, the refugee situation, the key issues associated with it, I would argue, are not fundamentally different today than they were back in the early 80s when we wrote uh, that report. Um, and I think if I was asked to write a book on the global refugee situation today, I could probably quite happily take whole chunks out of the ICHI report and present them, and nobody would know that they were 30 years old. So uh, what exactly, then, is the con contemporary relevance of, of that report? And I just want to kind of identify five key issues which I think are, are of some relevance today. Firstly, I think the title is very revealing. It was called Refugees, the Dynamics of Displacement. But if you actually look at the text of that book, it was actually much more about displacement than it was about refugees. So as well as having a chapter on refugees and a chapter on asylum seekers, it looked at a whole range of other displacement phenomena, of mass expulsions, urban removal programs where people are taken from urban to rural areas, compulsory relocation programs, what we at the time called environmentally displaced people, which some people erroneously call climate refugees today. Um, and we also refer to the, the whole phenomenon of what we call development-induced displacement. So I think the book was a little bit ahead of its time in identifying those various groups of displaced people going beyond the strict refugee definition. Perhaps, as you've already said, Gonzalo, perhaps the most important feature of the book is that it did give some visibility to the whole IDP issue. Now, I don't want to claim that the Commission and the book um, invented or discovered the issue of IDPs. Francis Deng and Roberta Cohen were already doing very valuable work at the time, but I do think that um, the Commission helped to push the agenda a little bit on the IDP issue. And of course, subsequently, that became an increasingly important humanitarian issue with the appointment of a special representative, the guiding principles, the Kampala Convention, etc., etc. One of the issues we might want to discuss later on, if we have time, is why the IDP issue seemed to have disappeared from view and why it was only warranted two sentences in the New York Declaration that was issued last September. So the complexity of displacement in terms of not just refugees but other groups of people, I think, is still extremely relevant. The second issue I would say that you'll find in that report, which is still relevant today, is asking some, I think, quite important questions, and I know Pia will talk about this later, quite important uh, questions about the distinction between refugees and migrants and whether that distinction can be held up. And I think even more um, importantly, uh, what was really a heresy at the time, I think, of the book came out, it actually asked, is the 1951 convention still fit for purpose? Now, of course, that question is still very much on the table. It's been given added prominence by the so-called refugee crisis 2015-2016. UNHCR's position, as we all know, continues to be, we've got to hold on to the convention. Any talk about redrafting it, reformulating it will lead us to something worse. And I totally respect that condition. I just wonder whether in the contemporary environment that composition could be held indefinitely or whether states are going to start agitating about a reformulation of the convention. A third issue that I found interesting when I reread the report, and it's been referred to this morning by previous speakers, was the whole issue of humanitarian cold nation. I think many of you will be aware that up until the late 1980s, including the time when the commission was sitting, humanitarian coordination in the UN was a bit of a mess. It was entrusted to an organization called UNDRO, which didn't have a great deal of authority or a great deal of visibility. And what I found very intriguing looking at that report again was a very clear recommendation to establish a new and more dynamic coordination body within the UN. And of course, that recommendation closely resembled what happened just a few years later as was mentioned earlier this morning, uh, when OCHA was created in the wake of the first Gulf crisis. So I think, the, again, the report was somewhat um, ahead of its time in making that recommendation. Uh, the fourth issue I thought was intriguing and interesting in the report, which still has a relevance, is that of minimum humanitarian standards. Uh, the, IHI, the ICHO report called very clearly 
for a, a set of standards that could be applied for refugees, for displaced people, and for conflict affected populations. At that time, not too many people were talking about minimum humanitarian standards. Of course, that whole issue was subsequently taken up by the Red Cross movement, the Sphere Project, etc., etc. But as we can see from the situation of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, IDPs in South Sudan, the conflict affected populations of Yemen, the whole question of minimum humanitarian standards is just as much on the agenda today as it was when we produced that report in the mid-1980s. And then the final uh, element that I found interesting in part was a very strong emphasis on solutions to refugee and displacement problems. The basic pitch of the book was to say it's okay to talk about humanitarian coordination, humanitarian assistance, and humanitarian standards, but even if you get those three right, it doesn't provide refugees with solutions, it doesn't reconnect refugees to a state. And I think it's interesting looking back that at the time the commission was sitting, resettlement was still a fairly kind of dominant uh, solution to refugee problems, particularly in the Southeast Asian context. In the decade to come under Siddhartha Ogata's leadership at UNHCR, repatriation became the dominant solution with 10 million people going back to their homes in that decade. Where do we sound ourselves now? Well, really we're very, very blocked in terms of solutions. There's historically low levels of repatriation taking place at the moment. Uh, the US has just cut its resettlement program and it doesn't seem to me at least likely that other countries are gonna step up and fill the gap left by the United States. Local integration has always been a problematic solution with many refugee hosting countries being reluctant to accept that refugees will stay indefinitely on, the, on, on their territory. We see it very much, for example, in a country like Lebanon where one in four of the population are refugees, but where the government is saying, don't expect to stay here indefinitely. We expect you to go back to Syria as soon as it's possible. Whether they will be able to go back to Syria as soon as it's possible is a very moot point because as we heard this morning, we have a security council which is moribund or dysfunctional or other similar words could be used. And I think one, one thing we have learned from the last 30 years is that in creating conditions which are amenable for people to go back and resettle in their own country, it's not something that humanitarian or development actors can do. Ultimately, it's a political challenge and it requires the constructive engagement of the political organs of the UN. Thank you. Do you want to uh, add anything on this first uh, question? I can add now or later. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just wanted to to maybe highlight um, the, the the point that Jeff made um, about the relevance of the Commission's um, findings and recommendations to to today. Um, you know, reading through the report, it was really it really struck me how. Um, as, as Jeff said, you could just cut and paste um, to, to a lot of the, the, the current thinking within the UN system and outside um, as, as, as to you know, the analysis of, of the problems, where the solutions lie, um, which groups are, are affected. And, and I can speak a little bit more later, particularly to um, its analysis of complexity, of understanding how movement happens, what drives it. Um, and then f going from there to the solutions, and I, I was particularly struck by by that. But maybe I mean picking up on on, on um, uh, something that uh, Jeff uh, mentioned very uh, uh, briefly, which is this uh, 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 debate or ongoing debate about refugees and and. Um, and migrants. I mean, I was uh, giving a lecture at uh, Edinburgh University uh, last week, and, and, and a professor uh, got up and, and uh, challenged me and, and, and said, you know, do you think, uh, uh, and he was obviously very passionate about this, and it was clear from the way he asked the question what he thought the answer was. But he challenged me and, and uh, vehemently and uh, said, you know, do you think it is ethical to make a distinction between refugees and uh, migrants? Uh, refugees get more attention, refugees get more uh, uh, aid, uh, migrants are just seen as uh, people trying to move to get a better job or to benefit from our welfare uh, uh, system. Uh, I won't say uh, here what my answer was, but I will perhaps ask you uh, what 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 you would have answered uh, were you in my in my in my place? <laughs> um, thank you. No, I think and, and that really is kind of part of what 
um, struck me about um, the, the, the Commission's report. I mean, I think the first thing that one would say, and, and that I, I think I've been saying for a long time to, to the gentleman who spoke to you, was that you, are in a sense, have a false dichotomy because you have one group of people that are very precisely defined in international law with the protection standard associated with that, which are refugees. The other term is, is merely a colloquial, it's, it's, a, it's a, a term that describes, in a sense, movement. Migrants, we understand, are people that move. Um, and there's not even kind of an understanding about whether they move across international borders or within international borders. You can be a migrant um, internal within your, your country as well. So I think, in a way, what, what we're seeking to understand is, um, are refugees different from non-refugees? Now, of course they are, because as I said, there's a legal definition to, to, to what a refugee is. Um, the, 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 this, the, the, the links between, in a sense, the asylum governance systems and the migration governance systems, on the other hand, I think is something that does need to be um, investigated. Um, particularly, I, I agree with Jeff that um, you know, what, what we're seeing is not particularly new. I think the, the drivers for movement have always been there in their complexity, but maybe we haven't understood them um, in, in a way that a protection response can, can be um, uh, put forward. But I think that we have, um, for instance, we have two um, uh, global compacts that are being negotiated. Um, and, and the reason for that really is, is the understanding that uh, there are drivers for the movement of refugees, as traditionally understood, within um, the refugee regime, mainly related to conflict and persecution. Um, and then there are other drivers that do throw up protection needs under the uh, human rights law, for instance, um, that, that will need a response. And very often people collide and move in the same ways and, and um, with the same kind of means of transportation. And sometimes there are people that move um, within categories. Um, and, and I think one of the, the, the interesting things, again, about the commission um, was that it looked at why people move um, and trying really to understand some of the, the, the same kind of uh, understanding that went into the New York Declaration's um, first paragraph, which says that people move for these variety of reasons, and sometimes they move, um, uh, their movement is driven by more than one thing. So the New York Declaration talks about poverty um, and, and, in a sense, extreme poverty um, as, as a reason for people to move. It talks about climate, um, and, and they're both sudden disasters, which we understand as you know, the, the main kind of impetus for movement, but also slow onset movement, which is recognized within the Paris Agreement as a form of, of climate change. Um, and, but then the drivers, the compulsions for movement that come out of a slow onset process um, are, are less immediate, maybe less kind of immediately understood as requiring a protection response. Um, and, and it also kind of more obliquely talks about inequality. And, and these are all things that I think inevitably we're going to have to look at within the, the, the framework of um, what does protection mean? How does displacement kind of interact with uh, protection? Obviously, um, we're seeing through the kinds of responses that governments are putting in place towards migration, um, longer, more fluid, more fragmented journeys, um, which are themselves throwing up um, protection concerns. Um, so if you think about, for instance, the movement across Western Africa or it, through Libya, um, you're seeing people that may not have left their country um, with a, an immediate um, kind of uh, protection concern but through the course of the movement and the barriers, the externalization of policies that are being put in place, the barriers that are being put in place, detention, et cetera, um, people um, have at, at the very least very immediate human rights protection needs um, that, that need to be um, solved somewhere. Um, so I, I think kind of coming back to the original question, migrant itself is not a legal category. Um, it's a descriptive term. But within that category, you do have legal categories. You have trafficked persons, you have unaccompanied children or children in general. Um, you have migrant workers, which are defined within the International Convention um, on the Protection of Migrant Workers. And so in a sense, kind of putting a, a, a big basket together to say, well, we just assume that these people move voluntarily because they're not refugees can obscure protection concerns. And this is very much um, one, of, one of our concerns in the context of two different compacts. Because the, the problem is when you, when you open up two spaces, the, the gaps between them could become apparent. Um, when you look, for instance, at 
one of the ways, one of the solutions, for instance, in developed countries might be to look at complementary protection standards, which are legally based in international human rights law, to say, okay, well, how can these standards provide um, a, a, a grounding of protection in a sense between the two categories, between the two compacts, um, really to, to look to what is a, a, a migrant in need of human rights protection look like? Um, and and there, um, there has been some thinking done um, to, to kind of understand vulnerability within the human rights context and for, for people on the move to say that it, it does uh, bring up certain specific obligations of states. Um, because in, at the end, refugees and other migrants are all human rights holders. And I think in a way, it's not a solution um, because obviously local integration does, and, 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 and you know, kind of local integration more broadly understood for people where they are does throw up um, a, a lot of um, concerning uh, political questions for states. But for instance, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has very strongly said in a statement earlier this year that regardless of the reasons as to why they're there, when a person is in the jurisdiction or under the effective control of a state, they are um, entitled to protection of their economic, social and cultural rights, which again um, means that there are very specific interventions that states are obliged to put in place um, to, for instance, ensure the right to health of a person on their territory, the right um, to, to housing, the right to decent work. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I think that for me, the, the, the question, you know, is, is, is a refugee or migrant is in a way not really the question we should be asking. It's really about how do we design kind of governance systems related to asylum, related to migration, and um, that can ensure human rights protection for all people on the move. So I think now uh, we'll try to uh, focus the, the uh, latter part of the uh, session on, 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 on uh, looking ahead. And I'll turn to, uh, uh, to, to Martin uh, now to uh, maybe if you could share your thoughts uh, with us, Martin, in terms of how um, the 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 protection uh, uh, regime, which for for many of us is under uh, threat or under uh, risk, can somehow be uh, 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 strengthened. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. And um, as you can imagine, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Um, Sia was the the great mentor uh, of my early career and I owe a tremendous amount to him. Um, but I actually also want to continue the process of deflecting the credit for this seminar, <laughs> from, which Mark passed on to me, and I would now like to acknowledge the Crisp family, <laughs> um, who, I mean, when I tell you that of the book, Refugees, the Dynamics of Displacement, Jeff wrote seven chapters, and I wrote one. <laughs> That's about it, actually. You know. I was with, with Nick, so. And Nick wrote two, I think, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Anyway, um, there's one person um, who couldn't be here today because he's about to welcome the High Commissioner for Refugees in South Korea. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Naveed Hussain for being part of the early discussions with Riaz uh, and the family um, about having, holding this, this event. Um, and since I am in South Korea, I thought I'd do a little segue to a meeting that took place there in 2011. And this was the fourth high-level forum on aid effectiveness. But at that meeting, the 3,000 or so delegates said, wait a minute, why are we talking about aid effectiveness? We should be talking about development effectiveness. And so the whole narrative shifted at that meeting. One year later, the then Secretary General, who was also from South Korea, Ban Ki-moon, uh, announced that he would hold a World Humanitarian Summit. Now, there had never been one. Nobody really knew what it was going to be like. But he passed the task over to the then Emergency Relief Coordinator, Valerie Amos. And she recruited Dr. Jamila Mahmoud of Malaysia um, to run the secretariat. 
Now, when this announcement was made, lots of people in the UN and in the international NGOs said, ah, great, now we can reform the humanitarian architecture, the UN system. We can reform the agencies and so on. And Valerie and Jamila, to their eternal credit, said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's ask some humanitarian workers in different parts of the world what they would like to see out of a World Humanitarian Summit. And from nine different regions of the globe, astonishingly, they all came back with virtually the same answer. We would like you to recognize the work we do at local level. And we would like you to support us and help us to strengthen our capacity to do it from preparedness to response to recovery, and not to march in whenever there's a big crisis, push us aside, and say, we'll take over. <laughs> uh, which is, unfortunately, what still happens in many places. So, and, and again, I think this is to the great credit of the two ladies, that the outcome of the World Humanitarian Summit, which is now just over a year ago in um, Istanbul, May 2016, was not a reform of the global UN architecture, but it was a solid recognition that the way international organizations work in countries affected by emergencies and, and uh, related events needed to be changed from one which supplants the local capacity to one that supports the local capacity. And I was very interested that uh, Riaz uh, mentioned this this morning as the fourth of the kind of the main outcomes of the work that IBHI did in the post-ICIHI period. Now, you may say, um, what have these two examples got to do with protection of refugees? Well, um, I think they both present an acknowledgement that all situations are different and all situations are complex. And we have one of the great um, experts on complexity theory in aid, Ben Ramalingam, who's going to be on the last panel here. And I want to acknowledge the work that, that he has done to make it clear how complexity affects the likely outcomes of our intervention. So when I had looked at these two examples, the development um, world and the humanitarian world, I thought, well, I wonder if we can say the same for the refugee world. Has the, the refugee world kind of woken up to this set of dynamics? And so I had a word with Jeff about this, and we came to the conclusion that perhaps nothing much had changed, and that when we listened to the current Assistant High Commissioner for Protection at the um, Executive Committee a few weeks ago, actually, his speech could have been given in 1985 as well. <laughs> and we um, recalled that when we wrote the book in 1985, this kind of discourse was the discourse that we felt was, should be outdated. And Jeff then said, wait a minute, have you read the 1995 State of the World's Refugees? <laughs> so I said, <clears throat> not recently, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he said, well, here's a copy. And the first chapter, drafted, I think, by Jeff Crisp, uh, <laughs> on behalf of Sadako Ogata, former commissioner of ICAHI, as was pointed out, says the following. The old paradigm for working with refugees is reactive, exile-oriented, and refugee-specific. The new paradigm, which is coming into effect gradually now as we speak, is proactive, homeland-oriented, and holistic. And I said to Jeff, 
Well, that's terrific, but, but what happened? <laughs> why, why are we still living with the old paradigm? And I think this is a, a, a question and perhaps something which this, um, this conference could, if you agree with me, if any of you agree with me, uh, could pursue further. And I have a couple of suggestions as to the way in which this might be done. And because I'm the age I am and an independent analyst, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about offending people anymore. <laughs> and I don't want to offend people gratuitously, but I think when something needs to be said, it needs to be said. And if it's said in public, it needs to be said in public. I would point out that the last UN High Commissioner for Refugees from the Global South was none other than Sadruddin Aga Khan. And that he retired from the job exactly 40 years ago today. Now, when I last looked, most of the refugee problems that the world is confronting are the consequence of conflict or disasters of other kinds in the global south. And why do we in the north still think that we have a monopoly on wisdom about how to tackle these problems? I just don't see it. I have to say that in the 25 years since the post of emergency relief coordinator was created, um, the only uh, person who held that post who was from the Global South was Sergio Vieira de Mello, and he held it quite briefly. Otherwise, everybody uh, in that post has been from the North. Now, one of the things that the Commission tells us is that when you have inspirational uh, personalities from the Global South, such as Prince Hassan, Prince Sadruddin and Zia Rizvi, all of them from the Global South. Yeah, I mean, things can happen. They were able to mobilize the most extraordinary list of people. Uh, McNamara, uh, many others of them have been referred to already. Gough Whitlam, Prime Minister of Australia, etc. And we've seen today that the work that they did really helped to shift the ground on the way people looked at uh, humanitarian issues. And I would strongly suggest that we need a similar um, initiative today to help to um, relaunch um, the, the whole way in which we look at refugee situations. And one way of doing that would be to add a word to the title of the, of the High Commissioner for Refugees. Why should it not be the UN High Commissioner for Refugee Situations, responsible for looking at the whole, um, at, at the, at the whole at the holistic, with a holistic eye at the situations from which refugees are coming? And another thing I would say, and this is using the example of the um, um, World Humanitarian Summit. I'm a little nervous here to help me out here about global compacts. <laughs> especially, <laughs> especially when we don't have any regional compacts to underpin them. And for me, the best piece of news which the Assistant High Commissioner gave in his remarks to the Executive Committee was that the regional organization of West African states, ECOWAS, has just concluded a binding treaty on the elimination of statelessness. And if, if they can do it for statelessness, there's a whole series of other types of initiatives which could be uh, examined at a regional level. But I don't think that the regions are going to wake up to this idea if we from the north continue to give the impression that, don't worry, we'll solve this problem for you. So that's my two proposals. Thank you very much.
I will abstain personally from, <laughs> uh, <laughs> respo from, commenting from on responding, this. especially yeah. on the uh, questions raised about UNHCR, because either I will offend my uh, uh, first boss, whom I ad admire enormously, or I will offend my current <laughs> employer and be, and be fired. Yeah. Uh, so I will leave that responsibility to you. I think this is now a good moment to open up uh, the, the, the floor for any comments to what has been uh, said before. We still have one more question that I would like to ask the panelists, but I want to make sure that I give the opportunity uh, also for, for comments from, from the floor, not the least to the, some of the, uh, uh, well, I don't know whether the pro provocative or visionary uh, oh, ideas from, 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 from Martin. So please, uh, are there any? Yes, please. Um, yeah, Ed Frankenberg. Um, I'm the director of Lear Geneva, think tank in Geneva. Um, yes. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, thanks to all three of you. I'm, I'm, I think I'm still young enough to say, actually, it was really worth coming, you, uh, coming here and, and listening to you in the sense of you being the generation for me and PR. We're about the same age, but that's the generation who inspires me. Um, one question, which is around accountability. Um, unlike other international treaties, and under IHL, efforts are being made to set up a compliance mechanism, which we know is hard enough. But the state parties to the 51 Convention has nev have never met. Now, obviously, in the, in the current political climate, this would be, I mean, to think that we actually can raise the bar um, would be utopia. Um, but looking at the title, Winning Back the Human Race, Winning back the 1951 convention could also have been the title. I feel that we have gone through a threshold, um, in spite of what you said, Jeff, and maybe, in fact, it's not so different from 30 years ago, but there's no accountability for states in terms of their violations of the 51 convention, whether it's Australia, whether it's the EU countries yes. in the country of Libya, we all know the examples. So the question, I think, back to you is what can be done I know that, for instance, under, under the human rights mechanism, PIA, there are some examples in terms of, for instance, at mm. least holding Australia to account. Um, but I'd be interested in hearing your views on the question of accountability. But if I may, I think, and this is an issue also that really disturbs me, there's also an issue of accountability of humanitarian organizations not using the right or correct terms anymore. Mm. Um, we know what IOM uses in the context of Bangladesh. Mm. Um, but sorry, Helen, I mean, the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, I think, has also gone through a threshold here by not using the word refugees um, in order not to jeopardize its operations in Myanmar. There's an accountability for these trade-offs, I think. And I, I mean, there's, what is needed there is actually that we have real open discussions about them. And we don't do that at the moment. And we start using terms in order to actually, yeah, I mean, as compromises where I would put really big question marks. So I would like to have Thank a reaction you. from you. Thank you very much. Who, uh, Jeff, Martin, Jeff, yeah, I don't know, Who, Jeff, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, if I could just link this discussion to the first panel this morning. I mean, I think what has become increasingly evident in the context of the refugee regime is lack of compliance and enforcement mechanisms. States have increasingly realized that they can violate the convention and other refugee protection principles and get away scot-free. I mean, Australia perhaps is being the prime example of this. We also see it in the EU and Libya, I think. Um, and I've been trying to think through a little bit about you know, how, how we can get round to the fact that there, are a there is a lack of enforcement and compliance mechanisms within the international refugee regime. Something I did recently was just to kind of quickly skim the literature to see what are people saying about the so-called global refugee crisis, which I think is a misnomer, but I just checked to see what people are saying. The one expression that comes up time and time again in almost every article is, we need political will. If only we had political will, we wouldn't have refugee situations and we'd be able to resolve those that already exist. But from that search of the literature, I didn't see anybody really trying to define what political will means. And then secondly, and more importantly, how do you actually generate it and sustain it? Mm. So I'm playing around with a few ideas in that general area at the moment, which I hopefully will, will answer some of Ed's uh, very interesting question. So I think to some extent you can rely or depend on the humanitarian instincts of prominent leaders. I think we've seen it in Germany, we've seen it in Canada. Mm. Um, we've seen it, I think, currently in Bangladesh. It's been quite remarkable for me to see uh, the Bangladesh quite positive um, response to the Rohingya crisis. Um, 
But I would argue that you can't rely on the best instincts of politicians. You have to try and generate political will in other ways. So the kind of strategy that I'm trying to develop at the moment and playing around with and thinking of writing something about is firstly we need to look at incentives. What incentives exist for people to actually respect the international refugee law and to maintain its principles? I think there are political, economic, personal and other incentives, development incentives. And I think we need to work as to how we actually project those more effectively. Secondly, I think there are obligations. I mean, I, sometimes when we talk about the Refugee Convention, states give the impression that these were dre the convention was dreamt up by Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch. It wasn't. It was a, a state-led instrument. So states have taken on obligations to refugees in many different respects, national laws, constitutions, regional agreements, global agreements, membership of the U United Nations itself imposes certain obligations. So I think we need to see how we can actually get states to take those obligations more seriously and actually rec um, respect them in, in, in practice. And then thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, I think we need to look at the whole notion of pressure, pressure groups. You know, who are the key constituencies in obliging states to live up to uh, their principles when it comes to refugee protection? You won't like this uh, very much, Gonzalo. I'd say that my sense is that UNHCR is a de decreasingly important player in terms of putting pressure on states. And I think this has come out already quite a lot in the discussion. The real action at the moment is on civil society, local volunteerism, etc. And I think that's where the real mobilizing force is going to come from. So I would say, in answer to your question, we're not going to arrive at the enforcement mechanisms, but maybe a mixture of incentives, obligations, and pressure from relevant constituencies might improve the situation a little bit. On that last point, actually, I will get <laughs> uh, revert back, but I fully agree yeah. with you. Okay. Uh, every time I uh, give a lecture or talk, I, I, I always say the same, that the, the I'm not sure if there were ever such golden days, as you say, but there was a time when, uh, and I, I, uh, this is now my third representative post, and my, my first one was when I was 32, which is almost 20 years ago. Uh, there was a time when uh, when we were negotiating, and I'm not talking f for the experience of, of let's say, of a re representative, it was much, well, not much easier. It was a little bit less difficult uh, for me to walk into a minister's office uh, with the refugee convention uh, under my arm and to try to negotiate and get uh, concessions from that uh, government based uh, on the refugee convention and on the fact that I was representing you in Asia. Those days are gone. Uh, and I can tell you as a represent, those days are gone. And so the way that uh, at least I personally recognizing that those days are gone, try to uh, operate is that before I walk into any minister's office, I try to build a coalition uh, around uh, an issue. And that may include NGOs, uh, 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 individuals, uh, parliamentarians, uh, media, uh, uh, etc. So I cannot agree more uh, with you that that uh, that in order to pressure governments or to hold them uh, accountable, uh, neither the convention nor UNHCR by themselves are are, are going to do the 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 trick. Sorry, there was a gentleman who wanted to ask. A It's a more even complexity theory. I want to talk as one of the one of the um, organisers of a big march in London two years ago in 2015, which starts off one wet, um, uh, Wednesday, uh, Monday evening, where we put a message on Facebook, basically saying we want to organise a march in solidarity with refugees. Um, we imagined there would be about four of us standing around in the rain with placards. Two days later, when 10,000 people had signed up, we had the Metropolitan Police phone us up saying, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> um, when the march actually happened, there was 100,000 of us walking from Marble Arch through to Parliament Square. We got the authorization to actually march on Parliament Square, which is unusual. And the BEC called it the greatest act of solidarity in uh, the UK in living memory. Now, as someone that worked in the humanitarian system, the, the organization that then formulated from that, which is called Solidarity with the Refugees, was one that I thought I would be able to play an active role in brokering connections to the colleagues and organizations like 
UNHCR, like IRC, and so on, that actually work on these issues. So that this grassroots movement, this horizontal network movement that I was part of, could actually connect to the professionals. It proved almost impossible to make it happen, to actually make those connections. And that, my challenge is, I don't think we are connecting enough with the pressure groups that, that can actually move the needle on government pressure, that can actually create the political will. And I, I want to put that to you as a challenge and ask, how can we deal with it? Okay. Sorry, yes. Please. And then we may have to, to we just skip the last question. Yeah. Thank you. Please. Uh, my name is Fakhri Mansour, and I was working with UNHCR in Syria, Damascus, as a humanitarian affairs officer. Um, yesterday, I was on the phone with my supervisor, who's now a very close friend. She was working in Damascus, and now she's working on Yemen operation. And she told me that if there are half a million people besieged in Syria, we have the whole population in Yemen being besieged. And since now, we are talking about the dynamics of displacement. I'm wondering if um, international organizations, donors, um, decision makers, and even researchers are giving so much attention to people on the move, refugees, rather than trapped people, people who are besieged in their own places. So what can be done in this regard? And is the protection regime is sufficient um, to provide protection uh, and response to, do, to those uh, trapped people? Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll very briefly respond. Uh, I mean, I think this is absolutely... I, I mean, I have been gobsmacked since 2012 by the failure of everybody, including myself, I suppose, to do something effective about exactly the phenomenon you're talking about in Yemen, but also what we heard earlier this morning in Syria with the um, using food and, uh, as a weapon, dropping bombs on, on clinics and so on. It's, it's an astonishing thing that we have not been able to respond to this. And I wonder, um, Antonio, are you here? I am. <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask you? Yes. All right. <laughs> Maybe you could give Antonio the floor for a moment, in a way. Uh, but I, I, I pick up also what, what Ben says. And I think that um, if it were to be understood that international organizations saw it as part of their remit, uh, to be, well, I keep coming back to this word. I mean, when, when, when Jeff talked about the, the solutions that may be available, holistic, holistic in our thinking about these problems, um, then the, you know, the international organizations have to understand that popular outrage is a tremendously important uh, phenomenon mm -hmm. and needs to be made use of. And I want to march, you know. <laughs> when you organize the next one, let me know. <coughs> Good. We'll give yeah. the last word to Antonio, and then I, I think I'm afraid we'll have to, uh, we'll have to oh, wrap right. up. Should I shout? Or no, no. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, outrage. outrage. Show, show some outrage. Mm. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for making this connection. I, I'm all for holistic solutions, and in fact, listening to Martin, I was thinking, but why are we talking about holistic solutions for refugees? I think we should be talking about vulnerability in general and about people who are threatened for whatever reason. Mm. And that what links to uh, an idea that a few of us are trying to put together of how can we channel the outrage or the lack of outrage? How can we create a, uh, some kind of, of a movement in civil society, a citizens movement in the North and in the South to put pressure on our member states, on the Security Council. I'd like, just like to quote one thing. Uh, the, there was an article in The Lancet about a year ago that starts by saying, what has happened in Aleppo reminds me of Guernica, and Guernica signaled the end of the League of Nations. Are we going towards the end of the United Nations? And this wasn't written by some rabid uh, NGO person or some disgruntled academic. It was written by, jointly by the permanent representative of France at the United Nations and a French academic. But the fact that 
This outrage has now reached even some members of the Security Council is a sign of the times. So we uh, watch this space. We will be trying to, we're having a meeting tomorrow in London and various others in Geneva, Paris, and hopefully in the Global South to try to see if it's feasible to set up something that, you know, challenging us to respond and creates a movement around it. So you're all invited. Well, on that note, I want to thank very much our uh, uh, panelists, uh, but, but also our, our audience for, I think, what has been a, quite a, a, a lively uh, uh, debate uh, with some uh, outrage uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in it. So uh, thank you very much to, to, to all.